In the past, gaining access to infrastructure to host your application was not very easy. And so applications were designed to work on specific hardware, whatever hardware you had access to. And that made it difficult to scale and move them between different environments. However, with the advent of cloud computing, we can now provision infrastructure instantly and easily. Solving that infrastructure problem now makes it possible to scale the application easily by running it on multiple servers or even moving them between different environments based on our requirements. But for that to happen, your application needs to be architected and developed in a way that makes it easily scalable, portable, and maintainable. And that's what cloud native architecture is. Cloud native architecture is all about designing applications to work seamlessly on cloud platforms by utilizing all of the capabilities that cloud platforms provide, be it on-prem private cloud environments or public cloud environments like AWS, Azure, or GCP, or hybrid mode. In this video, we're going to look at the five key principles of cloud native architecture that was explained by Tom Gray from Google on his blog that you can see here. My name is Mumshat Manambath, and uh, welcome to this video. First, I'll go over the five principles, and then we'll explain each one with an example. So the first principle of cloud native architecture is to design for automation. The second principle is to ensure that it, the components are stateless. The third principle is to favor managed services when possible. The fourth principle is to practice defense in depth. And finally, the fifth principle is to always be architecting. So let's dive into each of these with examples below. Now, in the past, setting up a server for your application was a time-consuming and error-prone process. So you had to order a server, wait for it to arrive, physically install it, install the operating system, and configure all the necessary software. And this process could take weeks or even months. And if you made a mistake during any step, it could lead to inconsistency and issues in the future. Today, provisioning a server is as easy as clicking a few buttons on the console of cloud platforms. And as such, the dependency on the infrastructure is much less and setting it up is way more simple. And so it's important to design your architecture with automation in mind. This means creating infrastructure and code that can be easily automated and managed by software tools. And by doing so, you can provision resources in minutes and ensure consistency across your infrastructure. Now, when designing for automation, it's important to consider the entire life cycle of your application from development to deployment to scaling. This means choosing the tools and services that are easily automated, creating your infrastructure as code, and using continuous integration and delivery practices. Now, by designing for automation, you can reduce manual errors, increase consistency, and speed up your development and the whole deployment process. And this will enable you to focus on building and improving your application rather than spending time on tedious and error-prone infrastructure tasks. So let's look at an example here. Let's say you have a web application that requires a database. And in the past, you would have to manually set up the database server, install the necessary software, and configure the database. With design for automation, you can create a script that automates this process. For example, using a tool like Terraform, you can write a code snippet that describes the infrastructure you need, including the database server and necessary software. And then with a single command, you can provision the database server and ensure that it is set up exactly as you need it. So here's an example of the Terraform code snippet. And with this code, you can provision an AWS EC2 instance with the MySQL installed and secured on it. And this is just a simple example, but it illustrates how you can use infrastructure as code to automate the process of setting up infrastructure for your application. Let's look at another example. So cloud native approach encourages designing applications to leverage automated processes. So this includes continuous integration and continuous deployment pipelines, auto scaling and self healing mechanisms. And in this example, we can set up a CI/CD pipeline using tools like Jenkins or GitHub Actions. And whenever the code is updated in the repository, the pipeline automatically builds, tests and deploys the application to the of different environments, including the production environment. So this reduces the time and effort required to update the application. Now let's talk about designing components to be stateless. Now, In the past, because of the infrastructure limitations, we never really thought about a scenario where 
you'll have many instances of the same application running at the same time and traffic load balance between them. And even if we did, we relied on sticky sessions where the load balancer needed to be aware of which instance served a particular user and routed the user to the same session. And we used to build applications that relied heavily on shared state between different instances or components of the application. And this meant that if one component failed or became overloaded, it could bring down the entire application. Now, with the rise of cloud native architecture, we've shifted away from the traditional monolithic applications and towards a more modular approach, microservices. And one of the key principles of this approach is designing components to be stateless. So what does it mean to be stateless? What is state? So a state is how an application defines the state of a user. For example, if the user is logged in or not, or sometimes it could be what items are in the user's cart, just to pick a trivial example. So if that state information is stored in the memory or local disk on the same instance where the application is running, and that instance of the application crashes, the user's state is lost. And so all the work done by that user is gone. With today's applications requirements to be hyperscale, there is no room for such errors, irrespective of which instance is serving a client, it should work seamlessly, which is why the state is made independent of the application instance. So stateless architecture makes the application more fault tolerant, resilient and scalable. So let's say you're building an e-commerce website where users can search for products and add them to their shopping carts. In a stateful architecture, the shopping cart information would be stored in the user's session, which is maintained by the application server. So most e-commerce applications stored in the database for obvious reasons, but let's just assume that in this case, it's stored in the user's session. Now, this means that if the server crashes or becomes overloaded, the user's shopping cart data would be lost. Additionally, if you wanted to scale the application horizontally, you would need to ensure that all the instances have access to the same shared session data. However, in a stateless architecture, you would store the shopping cart information in a centralized location like a database or cache, and each request would include the necessary information to retrieve and update that data. So here's an example code snippet in Python. So this code stores the cart items in the local memory of the instance. A better approach would be to store those in an in-memory database such as Redis. So the code can be updated to store and retrieve cart information from a Redis database. Now, building and maintaining an IT infrastructure used to be a challenging and time-consuming task. You had to order servers, install the necessary software, set up networking between these servers, all of which took days or even weeks. And on top of that, you had to manage and maintain the infrastructure yourself, which was mostly very costly and time-consuming. Now, today, with the capabilities offered by cloud providers, you can now offload much of the infrastructure management and maintenance to cloud provider services, allowing you to focus on your core business instead. This is where the favor managed services principle comes in. So managed services are pre-built cloud services that provide specific functionality such as databases or message queues, machine learning models, etc. By using managed services, you don't have to worry about managing the underlying infrastructure as a cloud provider takes care of that for you. Instead, you can focus on using the service to build your application. So in the last example, we talked about using Redis. Now you could create a server install operating system on it, configure networking and security, and then install the prerequisites required to install Redis on it, and then install Redis on it and configure this space and then monitor the disk space and make sure every time it's about to fill up, you expand disk space, take the server down for maintenance, apply patches, etc. With a managed Redis service, such as the one that's available on Google Cloud or AWS, you can skip all of those steps and gain access to a Redis instance in just a few minutes. So there are several benefits to favoring managed services in your architecture. So first, managed services can save you time and resources. Since you don't have to worry about managing the infrastructure, you can free up your time and resources to focus on developing your application. Second, managed services can improve your application's scalability and reliability requirements. So cloud providers have the resources and expertise to ensure that their managed services are highly available and can scale to meet your application's demands. And third, managed services can provide you with better security and compliance. Again, cloud providers invest heavily in security and compliance, so you don't have to worry about maintaining the necessary security and compliance 
measures yourself. The fourth principle talks about practicing defense in depth. In the cloud native world, security is of paramount importance. So you need to ensure that your applications and data are protected from all kinds of threats, both external and internal. And that's where the practice defense in depth principle comes in. So traditionally, security was implemented using perimeter based approaches where you would secure the outer layer of your network with firewalls and other security measures. However, this approach is no longer sufficient in the cloud native world where applications are distributed and run across multiple environments. The practice defense in-depth principle advocates for a multi-layered approach to security. This means that you should have multiple layers of security controls in place to protect your applications and data. For example, you might have firewalls, intrusion detection systems, access controls, encryption, and other security measures at different layers of your infrastructure. But why is this necessary? A single layer of security is always susceptible to being breached or circumvented. By having multiple layers of security, you can ensure that even if one layer is breached, there are other layers in place to protect your applications and data. And furthermore, a multi-layered approach to security can help you detect and respond to security threats more quickly. By monitoring multiple layers of your infrastructure, you can identify anomalous behavior and take action before it's too late. So let's say you have a cloud native application that accepts users inputs and stores it in a database. So to protect this application, you could implement the following layers of security control. So at the network layer, you could use firewalls to restrict incoming traffic to only the necessary ports and protocols. At the application layer, you could implement input validation to ensure that user input is properly formatted and does not contain any malicious code. At the database layer, you could use encryption to protect sensitive data at rest and implement access controls to ensure that only authorized users can access the database. Have you ever heard the phrase, if it's not broken, don't fix it? In the world of cloud native architecture, that phrase doesn't really apply. That's because in this world, we're always looking for ways to improve and optimize our systems. And that's where the principle of always be architecting comes in. Now in cloud native architecture, the rate of change is very high. New technologies and tools are constantly being developed and customer demands are always evolving. So therefore, it's crucial to keep an eye on the architecture of our application and make changes as necessary. By continuously monitoring and analyzing our architecture, we can identify potential problems and areas of improvement. And this allows us to make changes proactively rather than waiting for something to break and then scrambling to fix it. Additionally, the always be architecting principle helps us to stay competitive in a rapidly changing market. By making frequent updates to our architecture, we can ensure that our systems are always up to date and able to meet the needs of our customers. So in summary, the always be architecting principle encourages us to be proactive in improving our applications by closely monitoring our architecture and making changes as necessary. We can ensure that our systems are always optimized and able to meet the demands of our customers. That's all of the five principles of cloud native architecture. Thank you so much for watching. Check out the rest of our channel for more videos on cloud native computing and DevOps. And if you like our videos, don't forget to subscribe to our channel as we release new videos every week. If you have questions, feel free to ask them below in the comment section. Until next time, goodbye.